You're listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast, recorded at the BVA headquarters with your hosts, Kevin Miller and Tommy Alquist. Each episode is focused on shedding new light on different perspectives to create dialogue that inspires excellence. And welcome to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. Tommy Alquist with Kevin Miller. Tommy, got a big show today, huge guest, people are popping. And you know, the great thing about this podcast, it's all about the listener and what they get out of it. It is. I, you know, we've had a lot of feedback, Kevin. I know we get calls all the time of the stories that are being told. And um, one of the things that I've heard from everyone is we love the story behind the people that are starting businesses. We love to t- hear about grit, that determination it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, and so I'm excited about today because that's what we're going to talk about. Um, how have you been? Uh, you know, currently still employed. <laughs> and everybody that sees me says that, but you know something, I want to keep the, the wheels of the economy going and pay my taxes like a good citizen. Now, what about you and your plan? As I joke, for world domination, how goes that? World domination's going well. Yeah, watch uh, a lot of videos on you. We've been, uh, we've been, we've been, we've been very blessed and working really, really hard. I will tell you, I was with Reverend Bill yesterday. Oh, cool. Every single time I'm with him, you come up. And uh, so thanks for what you just, I don't know how you have enough hours in the day, Kevin. But uh, I guess when you wake up, at what time do you wake up every morning? About 3.15. Okay. When you wake up at 3.15, you have more hours than the rest of us. I don't know, Tommy. I don't know. (laughs) I still see the videos of you traveling the state, doing this, duck hunting only in season, and of course other things. And then, like, you make money, so. I duck hunted way too much this year. I would say. We counted it up. We went 27 times. Yeah. So the ducks. There's probably a, there's probably a, 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 like, some work group I can go to, some... (laughs) (laughs) Right, go ahead and admit I have a problem. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, well, let's get going. So, uh, again, one of the things we've loved is hearing stories of entrepreneurs, and we are incredibly excited today uh, to have David with us. So, our guest today is David McKenzie, a former BSU athlete and sir, now entrepreneur. Yes, this guy is everywhere, <laughs> and so uh, I can't wait to just hear your story. Uh, I know you a little bit, but I, I uh, again... The story behind the people that are that are really driving business is mm. it's fascinating to me. So welcome. Yeah, man. This is awesome to be here. Thank you guys for for having me on. This is uh, incredible. I love the environment. I came in here. I felt the energy. I'm like, man, I can't wait. That should have been a Jerry Lewis Dean Martin thing right there. That was funny. Or you Abbott guys- and Costello, and we know who <laughs> Costello would be. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for having me on though. Absolutely. Well, so David, um, you know, why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, how you how you got to Boise State, yeah. your past, yeah, and and and, and why you go through that. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you, not only to become an athlete, but but to become this businessman you become, and and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas. Um, grew up only child was was into sports, but as a kid, I was already um, before I got into sports, I was really into I was into commercials as a kid. I did Barney as a kid. I did modeling as a kid. And um, so when I got into sports, I kind of had to give up the whole modeling thing, the kind of the already the early entrepreneurial spirit as a kid and got into sports, very serious in sports and um, football, basketball, baseball. And then so basically I had a scholarship to go to Texas Tech. They pulled the scholarship from Texas Tech uh, for me a couple weeks before signing day. So I had to walk on to Boise State. And that was the beginning for me of the motivation that's kind of, you know, pushed me into. So wait a minute, you're a kid from Texas. Mm -hmm. So I I find this always, I love these stories, these recruiting stories. So Texas Tech, big deal, high powered offense, big powered offense. And so scholarship goes away. How do you say Boise State? Where does it mean Boise is a long ways away from Texas? Well, it's, um, you know, it was a hybrid offense there. And basically they were in a coaching chain between coach. I believe it was coach Tuberville and coach Kingsbury at the time. And basically there was new recruits. They were pulling scholarships and I had nowhere to go. But at the time there was a graduate assistant at Boise state named Joel Falani, who actually used to play at Texas tech as a wide receiver. He actually held a lot of the records before Michael Crabtree broke those records. And he was a GA up here at Boise state. And he heard some rumblings through Texas tech of a guy who kind of slipped through the cracks. He called me, coach Prince called me, got in touch with a little bit with, with coach Pete as well. And they said, we can't offer you a scholarship because sign day has passed, but we can give you a spot as a preferred walk on. You already have a roster spot and come. And I say, you know, my parents always taught me growing up, hey, if there's an opportunity, if it's in Iowa, if it's in Idaho, if it's in California, if it if it works out and we pray about it, let's take the step and let's and let's move forward. So what's what's the perception of a kid from Texas on a Boise, Idaho when you hear the call though? What 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 was your outside <laughs> impression of this place? Well, I mean I knew about the football program. <laughs> I wasn't a fan. I actually was an Oklahoma fan. Go figure. Ooh, um, 
And I was a huge OU fan, could not stand Boise State, you know, growing up. And, but I knew about the program. I knew about Kellen Moore. I knew about Austin Pettis. I knew about Coach Peterson. I knew about all these guys. And I'm saying, if I have the opportunity to be a part of that culture, I'm a huge person of culture, which is what I've implemented now in my, in my business as well. Um, I said, this is something I want to be a part of. So as soon as the opportunity came away, I said, I'm there. I'm absolutely there in all ears. And um, I was, I was super excited. So, but when I got here, um, the one thing I really did love was, of course, the blue turf or the Smurf turf, right? So I get on the blue turf. Coach Pete comes up to me, which is what is to me is what makes Coach Pete great is I'm a walk on who he really didn't even recruit. And he comes up to me and says, David, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're a part of this. We need you and all that. And I don't everybody out there. I don't, that goes such a long way with somebody who might feel like they're overlooked or alienated. So for me, that was huge in the first couple of weeks of practice in the camp. So that's why I knew this was the right place for me um, to be. That's great. Tell us a little bit about your career. So career, uh, it was a football career. Sorry. Yeah. Before football we get career, yeah, it was, yeah. it was up and down, man. I mean, as a, as a walk on, I had just kind of just had to fit into where, where I best fit in. I did some special teams, played here and there, but my tenure at Boise State, I was a wide receiver, was probably a tenure of some of the best wide receivers ever in Boise State history. I was there with Thomas Spurbeck, who's all-time leader in yards. I was there with Matt Miller, who's all-time leader in catches, Cedric Wilson, um, uh, Aaron Burks, Gerardo Boldevine. Um, the, the list goes, Shane Williams Rhodes. I mean, I was in a room with guys who were, I mean, top tier NFL prospects. So as a, as a walk-on in that room, I had a lot of time to sit, a lot of time to watch, a lot of, turn, a lot of time to observe on how coaches interact with players and, and tendencies and some things I liked, some things I didn't like. Um, and it was, you know, a lot of moments where I had to swallow my pride and to say, you know what, I'm here to serve. You know, I'm here to get these guys better. And that to me, I think was the biggest lesson I had, not only for motivation, but just how you have to serve the lead first. And so within that whole process, man, I mean, it was a lot of tears in those moments, knowing that I'm a good athlete, but it's, some guys are better, you know, and I have to do what's best for them, you know, before myself. So through that whole process, four years, it was tough, but the great part about it was I got to be a part of a great fraternity. I got to be a part of a Fiesta Bowl team in 2014. I got to have friends of mine like a Leighton Vander Ash and Jay Ajay, who I still talk to, you know, once or twice every couple of weeks. So it was huge for me to be a part of that and to learn. And once I was ready to be done with football, I was, um, you know, I learned my lessons and I was ready to transition into um, my, uh, my career after football. So I actually had a redshirt year left to play football um, I graduated in about three and a half years. And after I graduated, I said, I have a fifth year left to play. I had a really good spring, but I'm ready to, I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to That's transition to, to career. Well, you make it sound so easy. And for those of us, not like Tommy, but myself that have miles on the odometer, when we're so young, we're so emotionally tied to things. Hmm. Um, you know, your identity was football. You make it sound so easy when you're, you know, with uh, Shane Williams Rhodes and all these other players. And, the, you know, again, we say timing is everything. Could you d describe that, go a little bit more in depth on what it was like under Coach Pete to, to understand that you're not going to get the playing time, but your job is to make the others better? Right. Well, Coach Peterson was only there for my for one year of mine or semester before he went to the University of Washington. Most of my tenure was with Coach Harson, so that was also a difference of culture as well. Um, but it was really it was really cool seeing different cultures in a good way. Coach Pete had one culture. Coach Harson came with the more of a dominating attitude type of culture to where, hey, look, I know you're a walk on or whatever, but hey, try to prove it. You know, do something else to make yourself noticeable and all that. So. I think that was a, the biggest thing for me was noticing the change of cultures. How can I fit in? How can I show myself? How can I strive, show people this work ethic that I have? How can I show people these, these skills and talents that I have, not only in football, but how to serve? So when you talk about timing, um, you know, I had a couple of bad timing moments to where it was one year in football. I thought I was having a great year, but the team wasn't having the best year. So I wasn't getting the recognition that I probably thought I should, which means, hey, look, I have to take that in my mind and my body and say, you know what? I had a good year, but we're not having a good year. And it's about we and not about me. And you have to swallow your pride a little bit, you know, but I learned a lot from that. I really did. I really did. You brought up the word culture a bunch already today. And 
it's easy for guys, I think, that are folks that have been in sports because, you know, you the analogies, the clubhouse, mm-hmm. the, you know, the leader, the coach, the, you know, how they inspire you, how they, and, and then in the business world, it's really e- easy for me here in our office mm-hmm. um, because I like to, I like to surround myself with, with, with folks that get that culture mm-hmm. that come in ready to work, that understand the importance of, of, of teamwork. Um, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, here, here you are, uh, you know, an athlete, mm-hmm. part of two teams, coach Pete, mm-hmm. legendary coach will forever be coach Harzen, different style. Absolutely. But how do you take those, that culture you learned and how now do you apply that? Tell, tell us a little bit of that connection for our listeners out here who mm-hmm. know these coaches no, they're probably different, but what did you learn there and mm-hmm. how, do, how do you use that today in your business? I would say what I apply now to my business is um, the so what, now what mentality. You know, um, you get hit with adversity. Okay. Are you going to sulk about it? Because if you keep sulking about it, you have to go out there on the next play. If you keep sulking, you're, 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 you're going to get hit in the mouth, right? So it's so what this happens, now what I can respond, right? So when I came out of football... I not only had an essence of culture, but I had an essence of I'm going to not prove to people, but I have this grit of work ethic and drive to go not take over, but just do be the best version of myself. So I applied all those things out of football of so what, now what, um, never quit, um, taking advantage of your opportunity. And Coach Harson used to always say this, enjoy the suck. And <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you know, it's, it's a process and everything. If you enjoy the, if you enjoy the suck, you know, you'll, you'll embody it. You'll enjoy getting better. You enjoy, you know, growing pains hurt. So all that stuff, when I came out, it, it was, came out of football, it was like three to four months and I was hosting different events and I was hosting different galas and political things. And people were like, dude, why are you moving? Or you know, how? I'm like, honestly, I'm just being the best version of myself. I have this extreme motivation. I have this extreme passion and I want, you know, to succeed in my life physically, emotionally, spiritually, and, and intellectually and applying the, so what now what, and then enjoying the suck. Those things have really helped me tremendously of, uh, having a short memory and just, um, especially in the entrepreneurial world. I mean, you have to have a, a mindset and kind of a mentality of like, okay, this happened today. Is this going to be the, the identity of the rest of your day? Or are you going to change it and get a couple more W's to, to adjust to that? So I would say that's how I apply. Hey, before we get off, cause we're going to get into your professional career here and that's, <clears throat> I'm fascinated to talk about that, but enjoy the suck. Think about this. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, the more people we have on and the more people, you know, and the, the circles that we run in successful people work hard. Hmm. It's grit. It's ours. It's, it's, and, you know, I look at the people that I like surrounding myself with and, and they, the motivation that is to be around people that think that way, but, but the part of enjoying it, mm. I mean, I think as, as you reflect back in your life, the things that were the hardest, the things where you had to grind, where you had to depend on a team mm-hmm. and, and you got through it. And then you, the success that comes at the end is all that much sweeter if you're enjoying absolutely the path along the way. And so I, I really hope that, uh, as, as we listen to this out there, that, that people get that, that if you're not enjoying mm-hmm. the difficulties of whatever you're doing out there, either in your right. business life or your personal life, <clears throat> that's a secret to life for me. Is enjoying absolutely. The suck, right. Yeah. And, and you also, you know, can learn how to, you know, swallow your ego a little bit and, and learn. I mean, as a Boise State football player, when I played, I was a walk on, but all of my closest best friends were top tier Boise State players. I lived with Jake Rowe. I lived with Joe Monterano, who played with the Cubs and was a starting linebacker. I lived with um, Alec Danes, all these guys. It was times where I didn't make the bus to go to the games, mm. but they would go to the games and I would have to watch the games on TV and they would come back. But you, I mean, if you don't think that works inside of a person of dealing with the alienation, <laughs> right. dealing with being isolated, but also swallowing your pride and saying, you know what? It might not be working for me, but I'm happy for you, man. I'm happy for what we're achieving. And if you, I I went through four years of that, almost half a decade of that. So that to me, I think really changed everything about what I'm doing now, because my mindset was not that way at 18 years old going in. And when I left, it was like supporting, serving, working hard, um, swallowing your pride. I mean, it was... It was, it was some rough days, but I mean, the learn, the stuff that I learned from that, I, I think all those moments because it, it makes me now, you know, appreciate the people that are overlooked 
and also appreciate the people who are just in their process. Maybe it's not the time right now, you know, but eventually if you keep working, things can open up. And if you believe they will open up, it'll happen. Hmm. David, um, there was a great book written many years ago called Who Moved the Cheese? Okay. It's about (laughs) dealing with change. And it was very popular Uh, for you as a young man, as an elite athlete. Can you give us some tips on adjusting to change? You've, you've gone from the change from Coach Pete Mm -hmm. to Coach Harson. Mm -hmm. When there's a new boss coming in, everybody, you know, it's a reset. Everybody Mm -hmm. gets concerned. Based on your experience, what made you successful to adapt going from Coach Peterson to Coach Harson that we can apply? That's a great question. I think um, change is change is always good. I think you can't um, hinder yourself of saying, "Okay, I'm so used to this system, and I can't believe this." You, because if you, especially in the sports of Division One sports, if you continue to dwell on what was and what whatever, you'll get past. It's about the newest, quickest best new thing, being innovative, being changed, which is also an entrepreneurial thing as well too. Innovative change quickly. So what I kind of applied uh, with that whole process and change was just through teammates, through culture. And the coaches were great in that, in that full transition. And if you guys don't remember coach Harrison's first year, um, the, we won the Fiesta Bowl. So everybody adjusted very quickly. Everybody adjusted um, in the right way. But I think it was some players in that, in that locker room who didn't adjust. We had about 10 to 12 players leave within that change, you know, but some people stayed and said, you know, I'm going to fight through it. So my parents always taught me, you know, if you're going to move somewhere or transfer or whatever, make sure it's a, it's a thought out tactical move, you know, making a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A a calculated risk. Um, So for me, it was some players I've seen jump five to to five different schools in in three years and they don't really achieve what they want to achieve. But for me, I was like, Hey, I like it here. I like Boise. Football is not really my end all be all goal. And I'm sticking with this. I like Coach Harson. Let, let's see where let's see where this goes and end up working out. You have to want to be there. You have to want to be there. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's uh let's pivot a little bit. So you you're done mm-hmm. with uh your your college career. Mm-hmm. You're ready to get into business. Oh, I yeah. can't wait to talk to you about um this entrepreneurial drive and spirit that you have. Right. A little bit about, it's a little unusual, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of people come out and they're like, hey, well, where's the most stable fit that I can find? Where I can just right. go kind of take it easy. I, I, I know a lot of people. I'm going to go find the best job. Uh, but that's not what you've done. I mean, mm-hmm. you're doing a lot of things. So kind of tell us the different businesses that you've started and you're involved in and uh, yeah. and a little bit about, about where you are in those businesses. Yeah, absolutely. So when I came out of football, I kind of was more on the sports caster type of um, lane at first. So I was doing things with the ticket and hosting things. I was doing Miss Idaho pageants and other political galas. And then I said, you know, I really do feel that I, I this entrepreneur thing is calling me. There's a place called the Venture College, downtown Boise, where uh, young entrepreneurs out of Boise State can come and start their business in this incubator space there and learn. So me and my former teammates would go there to take classes, sophomore year, junior year. I was getting bit by that bug then. So by the time I graduated, I was already involved with uh, Michael Sumter as well. And Yeah, let's give a shout out to Michael Sumter. Absolutely. So for people that don't know what's going on out there, Michael Sumter is one of the greatest men in the Valley. Absolutely. Here. The guy's an incredible leader, visionary, genuine genuine and authentic love for people. And, and I just, I think really highly of this guy. So venture college down there is doing some great things. Absolutely. You're plugged in with Michael. Absolutely. And so basically I started this company called, uh, me and, um, a partner of mine called Bowtie Hustle. And we basically do customized accessories for uh, NFL teams, collegiate teams, fraternities, all of that. We partner with the company in Dallas, Texas called Reveal Suits. They have about 25 collegiate licenses to partner with the Dallas Cowboys. We supply them ties and neckties and uh, partner with the Converge USA as well too. So it's a really cool niche type of market there with alumni and with different uh, players and coaches and all that jazz. So that's kind of what we've been growing. And it's, it's been a super fun process of going at first, it was just a bow tie with no logo on it. And we go, what, what I mean, people are laughing, like, what do you guys, what do you guys want to do with the bow tie? So coach Rice, who is also in small percentage equity with this, the head basketball coach at Boise state said, you know what? I like that bow tie, but it will be cool to have like a little logo, something on there, whatever like that. So we go, Hmm, this could be something here of, 
for coaches, for players, for alumni. And we made that pivot, got that partnership. And now we're not only doing uh, customized stuff for NFL teams, but we are also transitioning into getting our own license and having multiple accessories come through our license to sell through different Boise State logos and and esports gaming and, and all that stuff. So it's been a process within that pivoting thing. But when I came out of football, man, it was that drive within the entrepreneurial spirit of saying, look, I don't know what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do right now, but I'm I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna apply these characteristics to it. And I guarantee you doors were open. And it's just been a blessing on how that's kind of kind of opened up. And I also touch on too as well with um, my key goal was to be in hosting and to entertainment and stuff like that. That's why I said in the sports casting and all that. Um, so what I've kind of visualized for myself was to build brands, companies, and to still have, be a media personality. You know, I joke and say the black Ryan Seacrest <laughs> at times, but um, it's... Um, hey, listen, at, at the BSU games this fall too, uh, you, you can sing some mean classic rock, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was um, that was the opportunity that kind of came where they were saying, do you want to do the on the field stuff? And I said, um, I mean, I don't know, like my former teammates are out there, like I'm going to be on the field. Like, I don't I don't know. And then all, all of a sudden my dad was like, hey, man, like have a good time out there. I'm like, you know, this actually will be a really, really cool opportunity. And it was the best decision I ever made, man. I have such a good time out there on the field and man, singing, living on a prayer and we will rock you and, and, and all the sing-alongs and stuff too. But are you doing it again this year? I am. I am. I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I think they want me to do, um, uh, for the basketball games as well too. So I'm excited to do that, uh, for sure. I think that's more of the oldies now, Tommy. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can we still call it classic? Yes. Why not? Why not? It's classic. <laughs> classic rock, man. I'm a huge, I'm a huge classic rock guy. So, okay. Yeah. And Bohemian Rhapsody. Now the movie has, has brought back queen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that Freddie Mercury. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I, um, I think it was, well, he keeps us on focus here. He's just like, I know. I, I don't yeah. know about you, but I think I'm going to be working for David one day. <laughs> no, I'm ready to go. No, that's what I'm thinking yeah. too. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm it's sorry. been fun. So, so you have, you have the entertainment side and, mm -hmm. and I, and I saw recently you were, you, you, you are doing some things out of state too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, along with our partnership in Dallas, Texas, I'm, I'm connected with a group, um, who helps run the national prayer breakfast and they help with different, uh, forms for students, leaders in each state to, um, apply faith and leadership to faith, leadership and values to their environment on campus and also to what the career paths that they want to do after. So me and a friend of mine out, um, in Kansas, help kind of lead the stuff of the National Prayer Breakfast and help, you know, help serve, help whatever help that they need. And they have these things that taper off that are part of National Prayer Breakfast, but they're called National Student Leadership Forms. Hmm. So they have Missouri Student Leadership Forms. They have Florida Governor Student Leadership Forms. So me and my friend um, had the privilege to host the Missouri Governor's Ball and Forum um, over break. And it was all student leaders over Missouri. We had um, the former owner of Learfield, Clyde Lear, um, who helps kind of uh, oversee everything. And it's an awesome environment. I mean, kids are coming in there on Thursday, not knowing anybody. And they break off in these small groups and they talk about faith. And these kids are revealing things about their life that they haven't revealed with anybody, sometimes not even their parents. And these, these students' leaders are leaving with new brothers and, and, and sisters in faith and leadership. So it's an incredible experience. And being tied in with that group is kind of also... Um, relates back with the football as well of, of serving. Yeah. And so um, it, it's been a blessing too, being tied in with them and, and, and hosting some of those forms out there. So it's been really... Um, hey David, I mean, give us back. your... You've said it a couple of times, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe dig a little deeper on this. You know, when you're, when you're around people, the, there's some combination of putting kind of God or a higher power, whatever that may be for mm -hmm. that person in their life and service and community, those words kind of go together. Mm -hmm. That's obviously very important to you. It, it comes up just in today's conversation. You keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of God in that equation and mm -hmm. community and service mm -hmm. in your life? How old are you now? 24. Okay. You know what? That's funny because when I'm on campus. <laughs> yes. I remember 24. When I, <laughs> I wasn't Kevin, thinking about the NFL or no. <laughs> entrepreneurs or the Missouri governor's conference. Um, <laughs> Very okay. humbling, David. Thank you for. But when I'm on campus with younger students, sure, 
they say they 24 is like ancient. Right. Uh, you're not ancient here today, buddy. No, no, no. <laughs> so, but, but it's your, so you're 24 years old and, 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 and you probably don't realize how grounded and how, I mean, what you're saying is just amazing for people out there listening. So tell us your perspective on those three things, God, community service, both in your personal life, your business life, and how it's how it's been part of you. Mm-hmm. And and for someone listening out there, what would you tell them about the importance of that, uh, of all three of those things in their life? Yeah, um, that's a phenomenal question, man. Like I, that's kind of my base of everything is, is faith and, and serving. And for me, that's kind of where I lean back on when there's, when there's setbacks, when I lean back on when I don't know which way to turn. But I would just say with anybody, I'm not going to force faith on anybody else, but you know, for me, it, um, I go back to a book I read called the rhythm of life by Matthew Kelly. It's, um, mastering your physical, your emotional, your spiritual and, and intellectual. Um, and if you master those things, everything else will take care of, uh, take care of itself. So every day I got to make sure, Hey, look, am I, am I in the right state physically? Am I, am I in the right state of uh, spiritually? You know, am I, you know, feeling my, am I, am I reading my book? Am I challenging myself emotionally? And once I do that, it seems like everything else kind of unfolds. And I just think when I talk about serving, I think relationships within serving are, are the most important thing. And that's why I learned to the people at the national prayer breakfast is that relationships and communications, man, are, are everything. Relationships are fruitful. And I'm not a person who likes to tarnish bridges. I'm not a person who likes to tarnish friendships. I like to cherish them. And I've seen a lot of people in the past, coaches um, included, who might, um, they, they look at the win. They look at the end result instead of looking at what am I doing in this person's life? You know what I'm saying? And, and I know I've seen so many people. I've seen a player uh, who hasn't done that well on the field. I've seen a coach come up to that player and say, you know what? I believe in you. I think you can... Um, I think you can do something today for us. And that player goes out and has the best practice of his life. I've seen that because I've got to sit and watch that. And I said, that right there is how you can create a team. You look at guys like Dabo Sweeney, what he's doing at Clemson. He's doing that exact same thing. And it took a while to get there. But now you see these yeah. Now you I see did. these guys. Yeah, I'm glad you had to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, thanks for Dabo. Yeah. <laughs> Alabama fan. Yeah, thanks. Kevin still having nightmares, right? Yes. Still reliving. Hey, is there, are there, is there a coaching combination that are more different than, than Dabo and, and your, your favorite My coach? My beloved Nick Saban. Your beloved Nick? I, uh, I don't know there are. He can run for governor if he wanted to of Alabama. And win. Uh, yep. You're, you're right. I, I think that uh, Dabo reflects the, the new style, the new breed of coaches where you actually care. And I think what, what happens is you have athletes that feel exploited and used and Nick Saban has a very business-like relationship, but Dabo Sweeney really gets into it. And his staff hasn't turned over either, which whether it's in business or sports, you both know is very important. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I got to actually, my last year playing receiver at Boise State, the uh, receiver coach coaching was Coach Keesaw. He used to be the quarterback coach at Alabama who under Nick Saban. And he talked about that culture, which was good to hear some insights on that. Um, but what I was saying with Dabo Sweeney, man, I mean, when I see the players, not only him talking about it, but when I see the players after games, when the national championship saying, you know, happiness comes from serving others. I'm like, when your freshman quarterback is talking about that, when your defense alignment, who's a, you know, all, all American first team, whatever, talking it like that, I go, you're going to win for a very long time. You know, David, not to turn this into caves and Prater, I want you to figure <laughs> out which is which. Um, <laughs> But but with Clemson, though, you had good guy. some guys on the defensive line that could have left early and made a lot of money, mm-hmm. but they said they had unfinished business. They left that on the table to come back because they believe in so much of what you and Tommy have talked about here, mm-hmm. building that community and living it. Absolutely. and But like, I just, that's what I've kind of seen as example, and I've just tried to apply that to what I'm doing now. So whether that's any new relationship or friend I meet, I try to cherish it. Anybody I, I bring on my team to help us with our business, I try to cherish that. And just to build that rapport between partnerships, between new opportunities, people within those doors that open, um, that's kind of what I've, what I've lived off of. So um, I really do a lot of sports analogies with a lot of things I do now in business. So the way I deal with people, I make Coach Pete references or Coach Harson references or Dabble Sweeney. So, um, but that just stuck with me, man. When I saw the national championship and I just see Dabble and four of the players talking like that, I go, man, that's a infectious culture that is, 
is something, something really, really special. So, and especially not to keep rambling, but if you're an 18 to 22 year old, I think you would be caves and I'll be Prater. If that's <laughs> what you're hey, you're, I like that. Yeah, if you're, yeah. if you're an 18 to 22 year old, I mean, it's not really much about X's and O's. It's about, you know what? This guy trusted me. I'm going to go out there and run through the wall for him. Right. But again, you had a quarterback who just left too, and he handled that fairly well. Who uh, from uh, from Clemson? Oh, absolutely. Right. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Hey, uh, are you a goals guy? Are you a are you a goals guy? Do you write them down? Do you are you short term, long term? Are you t t tell me how you organize your thoughts around your future, mm -hmm. uh, your short term future, your long term future? Tell us a little bit about that. Great question. Um, I'm a huge goals guy. I'm a huge person of. Uh, positive talking, positive, positive thinking, positive affirmation. So everywhere I look in my room is I am this, I am that I can achieve this. I will do this. Um, I will master these things. I will have these partnerships. So I have this kind of assurance. People around me always say, you know, you never say anything negative. Um, I'm not saying negative things will happen, but I'm a person where if I speak something, you know, if, if you're speaking something and you're working towards it, sure enough, in a while, something's going to kind of gravitate to you. And I've told, I've told a lot of people, I go, if you're, if you want to be a music producer, if you want to be whatever, start talking it, start writing it down, start speaking it. And before you know it, you'll look around and be like, how did I get in this circle of these music producers? Mm -hmm. Because you've been, you, you've told the universe, you've, you've talked out saying, Hey, look, this is what I want to do. So I'm a huge person of positive affirmation. I have goals all over my if you see my room, it's everywhere and, and books. And I just have it of, you know, with, with scriptures and also with positive uh, affirmation stuff of just saying, hey, this is what I want to be. Um, but I also think what's important, though, is not to have long term goals of like this is where I see David McKenzie at at 32. I think it's important to have weekly goals, daily goals as well, too, because if you don't have those, as you guys know, you, you're, you're going to you know, it's going to be a long road of discouragement. You have to have, I had to change that because I had this, I had this huge dream, but then I don't see it next Tuesday. I'm like, well, I need, man, I need to change that. I need to make some goals that, you know what? Hey, I got two wins in this week and that's what I got. This, this, this was awesome, you know? And I tell people all the time in entrepreneurship, they come saying, Hey, I had this idea. I want to do this. I'm like, dude, focus on two to three things. Do those super well. Yeah, I mean and if you focus on those two to three things and you, and, and you, you're putting that into your practice and you're speaking on those things and you're working at those things and you're walking in those things, you're going to do something. And if that doesn't happen, something else is going to open up. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, dude, you're young and you're ready to go here. I mean, <laughs> but it's so nice hearing this. Cause I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. you get people all the time that, that will say, Hey, can I come talk to you for a bit? And they say, Hey, what, what's the secret, right? What's the, What's the secret sauce into making something successful? Mm -hmm. And you've just outlined it, right? It's it really is, you know, put put God and others first. Mm -hmm. Work your tail off. Luck is not chance, right? It's not. It's toil, right? Work as hard as you can. And then, you know, I, I have this saying in my life where, you know, if you're doing the right things daily, and if you're keeping your mind in check, your ego in check, and you're just working hard and surround yourself with good people, then all of a sudden these doors open, right? Mm. And, and that's, you know, that's God, again, higher power in your life. And, and my, one of my th sayings I always say is, what, what are the chances of that happening? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a hundred percent, right? Absolutely. Because it's not, sometimes it's not, it's not us that make these connections. Right. We put ourselves in those positions and then those doors open. And then hopefully we re-recognize the, the hand of God sometimes in our life saying, Hey, but, you, but, but it's work. Getting it's, you work. There, right? it's those scriptures on your wall. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the work ethic every day and all you're doing and now doors will open and, and hopefully, you know, and I'm sure the next phase of this is that you recognize that and then give thanks, but Absolutely. that's the secret. I right? love hearing, I mean, it's hearing you say that, I mean, cause that's, um, I mean, you're a person I look up to as well. I mean, of what you have done as well, but it's just, I think the one thing to change everything, if you want to be successful is number one, change, change the way you're, what you're saying, what's coming out of your mouth and change on what uh, you're thinking. Cause I tell people all the time, I say, your feet uh, can't go where your mind hasn't, you know, and which that really means is saying, if you want to go somewhere, okay, that's great. But where is the capacity of your mind at? You know, are you thinking, are you visualizing that I want to be here? Are you visualizing that I, I see myself hmm. in this spot 
Yeah. And and another way I've always said that is, you know, people say, I I mean, I've been praying for this thing to happen in my life forever. And it just, it's never happened. And and I always remind them, I said, well, I I would continue to wear out your knees on your pants, (laughs) but you better wear out the soles of your feet too, Mm. on your shoes, because Mm. you might pray, pray yourself into success, but, but very rarely do those answers come on your knees. They come when you're out serving others. They come when you're out doing, Absolutely. and then all of a sudden you realize, Hey, my prayer was probably answered through someone else. Right. That door was open because I'm hustling, right? That right. door was there because of the work I'm putting in. So it's a combination of both. And, and I, I, I just, it's been great listening to you today. I, I hope that those people out there are listening today that are young mm-hmm. or that are older that are saying, Hey, I want to make some changes in my life. I want to I want to be inspired. What's the formula for success? Right. Rewind this, uh, rewind this podcast and listen to it a couple of times. Okay, David, here we go. Here's a little high speed for you. Now, Tommy has a life, but I live my life on the thing <laughs> called television. <laughs> and on television, there's a thing called HBO. Okay. There's a program called Ballers. Okay. And I don't watch Ballers. I do that because it's my job. Tommy would not watch Ballers because it's not appropriate. It's not family friendly. But it's dealing with life in the NFL. Uh So when you approach the NFL, Mm -hmm. how much of a challenge was that? Because you have people going up to these athletes all the time. It's the highest of the high. It's the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. And how did you, you know, get through that challenge? Um, And any lessons that you can share with us on on, uh, an insurmountable challenge that it may appear for us, but uh, that you've gotten through? Well, I, w- I would say, I mean, for us, it we kind of got through the door through our partners. We basically, they were already kind of tied in with these influencers and, and, and athletes and basically. Um, sure, but you had to have a quality product. and We did. Right. We did. And so I would, to answer your question, I think, number one, the person behind that product, you need to be a person who is authentic and genuine. I'm not talking about fake genuine and fake authenticity. Most athletes all athletes in the NFL or NBA, they're, they're, they're normal guys. But every time, every person they're talking to on a day-to-day basis feels like they're trying to get something from them, you know? And I have multiple, you know, with DeMarcus Lawrence on the Cowboys and uh, Tanner Vallejo on the, uh, on the Cardinals now, that's how they kind of normally feel. But if you're a person who is just, Hey, look, I mean, this is what I do, man. And Hey, what's, you know, I, I want to be, you know, close with you, your relationship guy. And they can see that. And, and since then smell that I'll do, they'll open up all the doors for you. Hey, here's, here's this guy's shirt and here's four or five of my other teammates Mm. to wear. Right. But if you're a guy who you're kind of like, okay, are you just trying to use me to get, you know, your money and to whatever like that? It's like, I'm not going to mess with that guy. They can smell it from a mile away. They can smell it within the first 10 seconds. And that's what I've seen to where the owner of the suit company in, in Dallas, Texas, who we partnered with, he's a former collegiate basketball player. So it's a little different to where I can come. Hey, what's up, man? You know, look, I've, I, I, I played with that guy, you know, whatever. But even if you're not, if you're outside the sports realm, a lot of guys are in that circle who I know who are their marketing directors or endorsement guys. They're just authentic, genuine dudes who are, who have that athlete's best interest. And that athlete knows that. And he lets them in his circle with that. But there's been so many people who they use that and say, Hey, yeah, let me get this. And they use his name somewhere else. And they want to promote their platform. It's just shady stuff. So that would be my advice, man. It's just, I know it seems kind of simple, like be genuine and authentic, but that goes a long way. So I would say those two, two things to crack open that door. Sure. For sure. They're giving us the wrap up sign. But you, you want to ask it or do it's up to you, you ask it. It's a very highfalutin operation here. It's like <laughs> coach Pete schemes this out, but uh, David, finally, what inspires you, sir? Ooh, what inspires me? Um, wow, man, dropping a dime question. I would say yes. <laughs> Tommy had all the compliments with his questions. Yes, I would say um, I was about to bring out an impersonation. I don't even know how to an- answer that. Um, I would just say what inspires me is just people who are striving for excellence and people who are who are excellent. I just when I see like anybody in their field who is just dominating or they're just, there's there's something about that person in their own industry that is like, how are they doing that? I'm just obsessed with that culture. I'm just, so whether that's Jay-Z and, and music and industry and, 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 and clothing, or whether that's, um, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg or any of those guys, or even on like a lower level, like all that stuff to me, is just people who are at an excellent level that just, I just gravitate to like, 
not the material things. I gravitate to how does one person create a, a, a process over years to create something that massive. And that to me is just like extraordinary. And um, yeah, so I would say that people within the excellence. Sure. Cause I was, I was watching the, uh, the, the graduate the other day. It's an older graduate. Film. That's like yeah. twice your age. Yeah. It's, it's a classic film, but I just, I watched that movie, Dustin Hoffman. And I literally left that movie, like not let, let the movie, but got done watching it inspired. Like I was like, dude, how does somebody create something like that? Like, so step, that's an example. Sure. He's trying to relate to you as an old guy. Uh, yeah. Right there. <laughs> We're living on a prayer. <laughs> hey David, this was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, man. Yeah. It was really, really nice for you to be here. And I think for what we're trying to do with this podcast, um, I, I just, I hope people listen to this and they're inspired by you. It'll be fun to watch what you do too. Um, yeah. I, I love following along and just seeing all that you're involved in and, and wish you the very best. Thank you guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. And to everyone else, strive for excellence. You've been listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. We invite you to find something that inspires you this week. Join us again for our next episode.